Um, All right, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5. My title for this week is Fruit of the Spirit, Part 7, Patience Pays. Um, who, who has been here in the Keys for quite a long time? Many, many, many decades. Who's, who's been here? <clears throat> I've got my hand up. Okay, not a lot of you guys. So just the, most of you guys know I am a fifth generation conch born in Key West and raised in the Upper Keys. So I've been here for quite a while. But <clears throat> I guess maybe what I want to know is who was here in the Keys before they redid the stretch? Oh, okay. All right. So I got more hands on that. That's really weird. I don't know why. Okay. So before they redid the stretch, if you don't know, the stretch didn't look like it does. Jewfish Creek was not that. It was a drawbridge and it would, it would get stuck open about every other day, right? Seriously, it was ridiculous. So before they did that, um, there were some signs out on the side of the road. Now, now, there were, there's, now there are two passing zones on the stretch and back then in the same places there were passing zones but before the passing zones there were some signs and it was one word on each of the signs do you guys remember what those were it says patience pays and then it said something else too does anybody remember what 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 yeah yes I knew somebody would remember okay it would say patience pays only three minutes till passing zone. I don't know why I remember stupid things like that, okay? I don't remember what I'm looking for in the refrigerator, but I can remember some signs that were up on the stretch. What was the point of those signs? The whole point was, hey, don't be impatient. Chill out a little bit. You will have an opportunity to pass that's safe. And remember, there was no barrier back then. Like, you went on the stretch, it was like taking your life into your own hands. Okay? And it was, it was a warning to say, hey, make good choices. Don't be stupid. D- don't pass where there's not a passing zone. You will have a chance. It's coming up soon. And I was thinking about that, just patience pays. Patience really pays off. And in life, it's the very same thing. In fact, it's a fruit of the Spirit. So if you've got, hopefully, you're at Galatians 5 now. I've stalled enough. Here we go. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 13. It says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather... Serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh." They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. So last week, what did we talk about? That's really scary that nobody remembers the sermon from last week. 
I'm going to take a water break. I'm going to cut out the last 15 seconds of my life. So last week, what did we talk about? Okay, cool. Like a third of you remembered. That's much better. We talked about peace. Who wouldn't want peace? Our key verse for last week was John 14, 27. It says, this is Jesus speaking here at the Last Supper. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And so that word, that word peace, it was irene. It means peace of mind, quietness, calm. But another translation, kind of what we were really looking at was an internal state of tranquility. Now that's, I mean, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want more tranquility, more peace in their lives? And this was our key statement from last week. The degree to which you allow God to rule and reign in your life is directly related to the amount of peace you will experience in life. How much you allow God to work in your life and to rule and to be in charge and to be patient, wait for his timing, that amount is the same amount that you will experience peace in your life. So verse 22, moving on, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and what's the next one? Forbearance. Forbearance. Forbearance is a a really kind of complicated, much more in-depth way to say patience. It means a lot more than patience because we kind of have some ideas about what patience is. But here's the thing. We were doing so well, right, in the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, come on. Who doesn't love love? Doesn't everybody love love? I mean, what the world needs now is... Love, sweet love, right? Right? Okay. Who doesn't want joy? Like, anybody else could use an extra dose of joy. I don't care how well you're doing. You want joy, right? And let's face it, you would probably sell your firstborn for some peace in your life. True? You may be even to the fact of, listen, I will pay you to take my firstborn so that I can have some more peace. Hopefully none of you actually feel like that, but you might. At times, we're real in this church, okay? But forbearance or patience, that takes work, doesn't it? And we were doing so well in the fruit of the Spirit, like, every, like, like they were going really good, and it seems like we kind of shifted a little bit. We took a turn. We're in a little bit of a different category now talking about this. And obviously, patience or forbearance, it's a good thing, right? Everybody wants it, but we rarely want to put in the time for it. Now, speaking of patience, there's a true story of a painter. And this painter, he was not very patient. He was actually kind of prone to anger. And so he went to uh, this client's house, and his client wanted him to paint the whole house. And so he asked the client, he said, hey, where do you want me to start? And the client says, roof. So he goes and he paints the entire roof. And so then he goes to his client and he says, okay, I'm finished with the roof. Now where do you want me to paint, inside, outside? And the client says, roof. And the painter, he freaks out. Remember, he, he's very impatient. He freaks out and he's like, w- w- I, I, don't you see? I already painted the roof. Like, like it looks good. Does, are you saying it doesn't look good? And he just goes off. He's like, okay, so the roof is already painted. Where do you want me to paint now? And because he raised his voice, of course, the client raised his voice too. And he says, roof. And the painter just throws all of his stuff down. He says, that's it. This is the last time I'm painting a doghouse. You're welcome. See, part of my job is to get you guys to think outside of the box a little bit. There you go. Roof. It was a dog in doghouse, a dog. Okay. Just making sure. Okay. Forbearance, 
Why do, why do some of you have your head in your hands? <laughs> Forbearance, patience, long-suffering, perseverance, endurance. These are all words that kind of sort of describe what we're talking about today and what we're going to be really touching on. And this is actually going to be in two parts. So patience is a, a simple definition. If we were to just come up with something, it would be being able to wait for something, right? Is that a pretty just simplistic but pretty clear definition of patience? Just being able to, having the ability to wait for something. We would call that patience. But see, forbearance is a lot different. And, and patience, even if you, like I was trying to think, you know, how would I describe patience? Or, or how do I see patience in my life? I wrote down, this is my definition. You can have your own definition. This one's mine. Patience is how long we can hold out before we completely freak out on or commit an act of violence on an annoying person. Is anybody else with me? Just let's just, we're in church, we can be honest, raise our hands. Yes. How long it takes us before we freak out on somebody and just throat punch them or karate chop them in the head, okay? Again, this is our flesh. This is how we in our flesh respond to things and we, we, we blow it. We freak out on people for no reason, and they're like, I don't get, what, what did I do? I don't even understand. And that's what we do, like I said, in our flesh. But forbearance is way different. It actually comes from a Greek word, and I, and I know I said, I'm going to try to lay off of the Greek words. And, but as I was thinking about it, like, I'm building an entire sermon out of one word, like, I'm, I'm like digging for stuff here, and as I dig into this Greek, it really opens up more understanding about this. So the Greek word for forbearance is makrothumia. Makrothumia. It means patience, forbearance, long-suffering. Now, wasn't that super helpful? Here's the thing, as I kept on reading in my source where I go to look up Greek words because I don't speak Greek, I didn't take Greek, okay, but macrothumia is a compound word. It's actually two words put together, which is the definition of a compound word, okay? It's macros, which we know that word, right? That word means long. And uh, thymos means passion or anger. So really, the definition of forbearance or macrothumia is long-passioned. Oh, okay, so now we're starting to see what this means. It's, it's, it's waiting a long time before you allow that passion in you, which could be anger, could be excitement, it could, it could be any number of emotions, it's not just anger. But waiting a long time before you allow that passion to come out of you. That's what forbearance is. And so that helps us kind of understand what we're dealing with. We have a phrase that's the opposite of forbearance. And it is called short-tempered. Right. So if we say short-tempered, forbearance would be long-tempered. Now, we don't really say it like that, but that's exactly what forbearance is. And so we see now, okay, this means a lot more than just patient, just, just being able to wait for someone or something. It's waiting or pausing before we become passionate and take action. Again, doesn't have to be anger, although oftentimes that's what happens. But we become impatient, and we see a shortcut, and we, we take passion. We take it on ourselves to take action and to move forward, and it's obviously oftentimes not in God's timing. So, but as with all of the fruit of the Spirit, every single one of them, we cannot generate forbearance or patience on our own. It's a, it's a virtue that God develops in us. 
and he allows us to go through different experiences in life and circumstances, and that's how he grows our patience or forbearance or all of these different fruit of the Spirit. Um, they aren't called the fruit of trying really hard, right? They're not called the fruit of, I'll pray about it more, although I'm all for praying. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of what God's Spirit does in us. Now, speaking of praying about it, that's a really good place to start on praying for these fruits of the Spirit, especially for forbearance or for, for patience. Now, I'll tell you a story, and I, I got permission to tell this story, So, uh, and she's actually not even in here. She must have gotten stuck back with the kids. So... Several years ago, when Lacey, our oldest, uh, was, was young, she was probably three, four, five years old, I don't know, she's 24 now, um, we were at a very different stage of our lives, obviously, so about 20 years ago. Nikki was having a, a little bit of a rough time, there was some circumstances going on, and we were going through some things, it was no big deal, nothing that anybody else isn't going through. Uh, at any given time, but it was just a challenging time, and she woke up one day, and it was going to be a tough day, and I, I think if we remember, the, I asked her about it, I think if we remember the story correctly, Lacey was maybe giving her a hard time in the morning, and so she was trying to get her out to school or something, and I, I don't know exactly how it happened, but it was just a, a rough time, and Nikki had a meeting that day with a couple of people. And she knew that this meeting was not going to be fun. She knew that this meeting could possibly provoke some emotions or some feelings if, if you, you know, maybe stir some things up if you get what I'm saying. And so she was praying about it. God, I need some patience. I need patience to get through today because my day has already started a little bit on the rough side. And we're already kind of going through some stuff. And now I've got to go to this meeting, and I am not looking forward to this. So God, please give me patience. And she prayed that right before she left our house. She got two houses down the road. She didn't get to the end of the street. She didn't get to the gas station, which is about a quarter of a mile from our house. She got two houses down, and she ran out of gas. Be careful when you pray for patience, okay? Make sure you pray on a good day, all right? <laughs> and it was in that moment she realized, okay, God, you want me to slow down. I was getting a little worked up. And see, God taught her patience through yet another trial. And running out of gas, okay, fine, not a you know, huge deal in the grand scheme of things. But it was just this little thing that God sent to say, hey, trust me, trust my timing. Now, I, I will take responsibility for it. In my house, and I've taken it upon myself, it's my responsibility to put gas in the cars. So I, I, I said to her, honey, I'm sorry, this is my fault. I should have had gas in your car. It's just one of the things I like to do as a husband. Now, on the other side, I like to think of myself in this circumstance as an ambassador for God's will. But that just makes me feel better. So anyway, <laughs> here's the difficult thing about forbearance or patience. It takes a really long time to cultivate. It's not easy. It takes a lot of challenging circumstances and times and things like running out of gas compounded on top of other things for us to finally get it. For us to finally understand that God's in control and his timing is perfect and we don't have to progress everything forward. Now, am I saying that we shouldn't work hard at things and we shouldn't have goals and we shouldn't continue to move forward? I am not saying that. But we know, don't we? We know when we are stepping outside of the box and moving things forward at our own pace. And that's what I'm warning us all to not do. So, forbearance takes a long time to cultivate. 
It's like a really good meal. Now, you guys know I talk about food all the time. It's, it's one of my favorite things, okay? If I have a vice, it's probably food or coffee, okay? But to celebrate my five years of being senior pastor of ICC last week, Nikki on Monday decided to make me Thanksgiving dinner. Now, one of my favorite things in the world is Thanksgiving dinner. Like, there's Jesus, there's my wife and kids, and there's pretty much Thanksgiving dinner, okay? It's right up there. <clears throat> and we go all out. Like, we, we spare no expense, we go all out. We do the turkey. Now, some of you guys might be ham people. Good for you, okay? We're not, we're, 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 we're real Americans, we like turkey. <laughs> and so, we do the turkey, and we do the stuffing, and we do the scratch-made mashed potatoes, and she makes gravy that just is like, you want to take a bath in it, it's so good, okay, right? So, and then we make the sweet potatoes, and you have to take all the marshmallows, and you put them on the top, and you have to toast it like a lot, like that's good, and then of course the green bean casserole, and you got to have the french fried onions on top, right? Like, the, like we cooked all day long, and I love to help, right? So we were in the kitchen, Isla and I were peeling potatoes, we were having a blast, right? So... It took all day long to make this one meal. You guys know, you've cooked Thanksgiving dinner before. Now, I'm pretty sure we could have gone to the grocery store. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure we could have gone to the frozen food section and found something that said Thanksgiving dinner, right? It's probably in a box. And it probably has turkey, and it probably has mashed potatoes, and, it, and gravy, and it probably has, I don't know, what else, and maybe some stuffing, and maybe like some carrots or something, right? Now, is that really Thanksgiving dinner? No. No, that's a microwave meal. You pop it in the microwave, like three minutes, good on you, go for it, right? That's not Thanksgiving dinner. Thanksgiving dinner takes all day to make. Why? Because it's worth it. It takes a long time and a lot of effort to make Thanksgiving dinner. <clears throat> Side note, just to tell you a little bit about me, a little, I guess, confession time in church. I'm sitting at the table. <clears throat> My plate is empty. And Nikki had already finished. She was already sitting on the couch. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, I am so stuffed. Why did I eat this much food? As I often do, okay? Told you it was a vice. Just confessing this to my church, okay? And then this weird thing came out of my mouth. And I didn't even really think about it, but I just said it. I said, you know what, Nikki? You know what I can't wait for? And she's like, what's that? I said, I can't wait to be hungry again so I can eat. <laughs> what is wrong with me? It's just that good. Because it takes that long. Because it, the, you smell it all day long in the anticipation. And it's a lot of work. And it's the real thing. And that's how forbearance or patience works. God, over time, over different circumstances, works in us. And we get tempted to not trust God in his timing. We get tempted to say, no, no, God, see, you probably didn't see it, God, but I found a shortcut. You ever said that to God? Don't do that, okay? God, I found a shortcut, and I, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I've got this. Do those things usually work out? No, no. <clears throat> I wrote this down. A lack of forbearance or patience shows a lack of trust in God. A lack of forbearance or patience shows a lack of trust in God. It's true. It's true. So what I want to do over this next two weeks, I want to give us three ways God cultivates forbearance in us. Today we're just going to get to one of them. This is kind of the big one. This is kind of the one that takes a little bit more time than the other two. But three ways God cultivates forbearance in us. So remember, again, you can't do anything to be more patient or to be more forbearing. That's not up to you. God is the one who cultivates 
this in us. But the application of these three things is what teaches us to be more patient. So number one, remember God's goodness. Now, if you've been around ICC for a while, you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, sometimes when you give us lists of like, here's what to do and da 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 da, like, you will, you'll use, you've used this one before, Trev. Like, this is one of your other points. Uh-huh. Yep. And if I, as the pastor, and I, as the guy writing these sermons, if I don't have this quite down yet, I'm willing to bet that there are maybe just a few of you in here that don't have this down yet. That we often forget about God's goodness. We forget to look back and see the amazing things that God has done in our lives. What's the opposite of remembrance? Forgetfulness, right? I have painfully come to understand how ignorant and shallow and faultful that I am when I forget things. I am what many people, my wife especially, would call a forgetful person. I just am. That's just me. And um, I'm, I, I pray about it. I've been, I was telling some of the guys yesterday, and I was asking one of the guys who's a doctor, hey, have you know, looked in this MCT oil? And I'm kind of a believer. You can talk to me about it later. Um, side note, be careful about what you say around a bunch of guys because they will take that in a completely different direction. And they were about to put something on the prayer chain yesterday that wasn't true, that was a little bit personal about me, but it wasn't true. Right, Ron? Don't forget, when you make fun of a guy that has a microphone every week, <laughs> just saying. But forgetfulness makes us look dumb. Forgetfulness shows our, and we talked about this on Wednesday a lot, our lack of intentionality. And forgetfulness proves we didn't learn our lesson the first time. And we tend to be forgetful people when it comes to remembering God's goodness and his faithfulness to us. And when we don't remember what God has done in our lives repeatedly, his goodness, his kindness, his love that he has showed us over and over, his provision, his comfort that he's given us, and last but not least, his patience that he has showed to us, when, when we don't remember those things, when we don't remember how God has taken care of us in the past, we will tend to think we have to take care of ourselves in the future. It's true, isn't it? That's our key statement for today. When we forget what amazing things God has done for us in the past, we will look at our future, we will look at a circumstance, and we will say, I don't know if God's going to come through on that. I better help out God in this situation. And what happens? Bad things happen at that point, don't they? Because we're not patient. We're not allowing God to step in and do what he needs to do. We rush things. We don't wait on God's timing. We think vengeance and retribution is up to us. Here's that, that kind of anger where, where that passion becomes anger, where somebody wrongs us, and man, they may wrong us incredibly. And when we're not patient, when we're not forbearing, when we're not long-passioned, what do we do? We snap and we let them have it. Why? Because we think we need to take care of this situation. And what does scripture say? Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So we jump into these things and we, sometimes we think we need to, to cheat or maybe to cut corners to get ahead in life, because God's timing is 
not quite fast enough for us. <clears throat> the best example I can think of is Adam and Eve. We all know the story of Adam and Eve, right? If you don't, this is a great place to start. Um, Adam and Eve. We have two chapters in the Bible, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, okay? They got two instructions for life. You realize that, right? Two instructions. Number one, be fruitful and multiply. Okay, do I need to explain that? There's kids in the room. Like, that was an instruction. Oh, darn, right? That was number one. Number two, don't eat from that tree. You see that tree right there with those fruit right there? Don't eat those. You can eat anything else you want. You can pretty much do whatever you want. Be fruitful, multiply. Don't forget about that one. Don't eat from that tree. It's bad. That was it. That was the only instructions that they got. And what did they do? They messed it up. Why? Because they thought they had something better in mind. They were tempted. They thought, oh, I need to be like God. <clears throat> the enemy, Satan, the serpent, came and he said just a couple of simple little things. He said, did God really say that you weren't supposed to eat from that? Did God really say that? What did he do? He brought doubt into the equation. Very simple instruction. Don't eat that tree. I don't know how I can make it any more clear. But did God really say? And then he told them, hey, you know what? If you eat from this tree, you're going to be like God. You're, you're going to have wisdom like God. You're going to, like, like why, why should God be above you? You should be equal with God. You can be just like God. Shortcut to life. What did Eve do? She went on her own timing. She was not patient. She didn't trust God. And she ate from the tree. Genesis 3, 6 says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. <clears throat> Eve, in her mind, said, you know what? I've got a better idea. I've got a better plan. God, your plan isn't as good as I would like it. I'm going to take a shortcut over your plan. By the way, Genesis 3, 6, if you look at that verse, it's pretty interesting. There's somewhere else in the Bible that talks about three different types of temptations. It says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, and the pride of life, right? Look at verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, pleasing to the eye, lust of the eyes, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, the pride of life. That's what creeps in and says, you don't have to wait for God. You, you just, God doesn't know better. You know better because it's your life. Why wouldn't you know better? And we don't trust God and we move forward on our own timing. We must always remember God's goodness and faithfulness in order to develop forbearance or patience. I made that almost where it rhymes so you could easily remember it. We must always remember God's goodness and faithfulness in order to develop forbearance or patience. And that's God doing the developing inside of us. Remember, you can't do this on your own without God's Spirit working in you. And when you're considering a shortcut to something you know is wrong and most of the time, there's this little voice inside of us that says, yeah, this is probably a bad idea. And then oftentimes, we still do it anyway. But when you know that something's wrong, first think about God's goodness and his faithfulness and how he's come through in your life. Be careful of the shortcuts that you take. There's a, an animated movie um, called Inside Out. Have you guys seen that movie, Inside Out? 
It's a, it's a great movie. It's about this, this teenage girl, and she has these five emotions, and, and all these mo- emotions have personalities inside of her brain, right? And there are five different char- characters, and there's anger, and there's sadness, and there's joy, and all that, right? So they're, they're traveling through her brain because they're trying to find something, and they run into this character in her brain that was her imaginary friend. Anybody remember the name of the, the friend? Bing Bong, yes. Oh, you guys are like on it today. I love this. Okay, so they meet Bing Bong, right? And to Bing Bong's credit, he was kind of crafted in her younger years, right? So he was um, simple. I'll put it that way. And so they're following him, which was a big mistake. <clears throat> and he says, hey, guys, I know how to take a shortcut. I know where there is a shortcut, And they're like, are you sure? And they come to this building, and he's like, listen, if we go through here, it's a shortcut. And they're like, are you sure? And and he's like, yeah, I go through there all the time. And he says, look. And he points above the door, and he spells it out. D-A-N-G-E-R, shortcut. The writing was right there on the wall. But they tried to take a shortcut. And that's what we do when we don't trust God. We try to take shortcuts, and it gets us in trouble over and over and over. That's a lack of patience. <clears throat> Psalm 103. If you got your Bible, just turn there real quick. Six verses that are absolutely amazing. They, they fit into this so well. Psalm 103, verse 1, it says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and here it is, and forget not all his benefits. What's the writer of the psalm saying? Hey, my soul, he's telling himself, Praise the Lord. Don't forget about all of his benefits. Don't forget about all of the good things that he has done. And because that's not enough, he continues on. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. <clears throat> Question, what are psalms? What are they? They're songs. They're poems. They're things that these writers wrote, David writing many of them, that were these things that they would sing all of the time. What happens when you sing something all of the time? You remember it, like every 90s hip-hop song, it's stuck up in here. Again, can't remember what I'm looking for in the refrigerator, but throw out a title and I could probably give all all the lyrics to you, okay? When we sing things over and over and over, we remember them. And that's what this psalmist is saying. Hey, I want to remember these things. God, I want to remember your goodness. Why? Why would we want to do that? So we don't mess up. So we don't forget about all the amazing things that he's done. And what do we do when we forget? We take matters into our own hands. We become impatient. We blow up at people. God's got this. Just back a few chapters, Psalm 78, the psalmist is talking about teaching kids goodness and faithfulness of God. In Psalm 78, verse 4, he says, We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. Why? Why do we need to repeat that? Because we forget. Because we forget. We get consumed at what's going on in our lives and we forget about the good things that God has done his goodness kindness forgiveness and his patience to us 
because guess what? You and I don't deserve his patience. And it's a really good thing we don't get what we deserve, isn't it? You don't want what you deserve. I say this all the time. The word fair in my house is an F word. We don't use that word because you don't want what's fair and you don't want what you deserve. 2 Peter 3, 9, and we'll close with this. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, here's the good news, instead he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God's not slow on what he's promised us, which, which is him coming back to us, okay, him coming and getting us. He's not being slow in that. Instead, he's patient with us. Why? Because he loves us enough that he wants us to get it. Us, meaning this world. He is patient with us. So what is the first way that God cultivates forbearance in us, church? We've got to remember God's goodness. I, I understand that there are difficult times in life and that, that sometimes you, you can't even see up. But there are always things that we can look back at and remember God's goodness. That very breath in your lungs is a gift from God. Every single good thing that there is in life is a gift from God. We need to remember his goodness. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your patience to us. Thanks that you are such a forbearing God that even though we deserve it, we deserve damnation, we deserve to be punished, Lord, for sinning against the holy God. But Lord, you are patient with us. And I'm so grateful for that. God, help us to have patience and forbearance in our lives. God, I, I know we, we, we live lives that so many things are thrown at us and and it's difficult sometimes, Lord, but just help us to pause. Help us to be patient in those times. Help us to trust you in those times, Lord, that you've got this. God, that you want the best for us. And God, crazy as it is, thank you that you allow us to go through difficult circumstances to grow our patience, to grow our understanding of you. Thank you that you love us enough, God, to do that. And God, especially thank you that you loved us enough to send your son Jesus to die for us. Thank you for that perfect sacrifice that he made on the cross. And not just dying on a cross and being buried, but three days later, rising again, proving authority over death, hell, and the grave. God, if there's anyone here this morning who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who has not put their full faith and trust in you, as we just sang about just a few minutes ago, right now in this moment, Lord, would they give their hearts to you? To say, Jesus, be my Savior. Jesus, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I trust in you. God, thank you that you are good. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the joy that you give us. Thank you for the peace that only you bring us. And God, thank you for the patience that you give us through your Spirit. God, help us to use it in a way that we will look like followers of you. That we will look so different 
to a broken and dying world, that they will understand that there is something different in us and that they will desire that. Help us to be those witnesses, Lord. And God, I pray for this time of offering. God, help us to be generous. Help us as a church to reach out in this world and touch people's lives through generosity. Thank you, God, that you were ultra generous with us. We love you, Jesus, and we pray all of this in your amazing name. Amen. Mm-hmm.